Section 843 uh, covers what happens in conductors and interestingly enough plasmas as well. So in, in this model, uh, the simple model that we had before where the electron was bound to the nucleus by some kind of spring restoring force, um, that force doesn't exist. The electrons are free to go wherever they like. Um, however, we still do have a damping force and of course the, um, the, the force that's from the driving electric field and since there's a mass involved, uh, we have to think about the mass of the electron. So the equation looks like this. We have uh, y complex second derivative respect to time minus the damping uh, single dot has to equal the acceleration divided by the mass of the electron. So charge electron divided by the mass of the electron times the uh, electric field that's driving the whole thing minus i omega t. And the solution is, of course, y complex is equal to some y naught times e to the i omega t. Okay, minus, minus. Okay. And where y naught is just, if you plug it in, plug and chug, you'll get y naught is equal to minus q over m divided by omega squared, the frequency of the driving frequency, minus i times the damping times omega e naught. So that's what happens when you eliminate, eliminate the, uh, the restoring force, the, uh, <coughs> what do they call that in the book again? The uh, binding force. So there's no binding force in this case. So um, rather than talk about the polarization, which, you know, in this case, the distance is between the original uh, proton or the original nucleus and the electron can get quite large, Let's talk instead about the current. The current, J, is just going to be the charge, um, the number of molecules times the numbers of free electrons per molecule times the charge of the electron times the velocity. So uh, our complex J, the actual J is just the um, real part of that, is going to be uh, NFQ uh, squared over M, Q over M over here divided by gamma minus i gamma, i omega, excuse me, times the driving electric field vector. Okay, so um, what happened? Okay, yeah, because it's the time derivative of y. Okay, uh, so uh, th this right here plays the role of sigma, but now we have a complex sigma. Um, at low frequencies, so when this number at the bottom is very large, um, this becomes <clears throat> at low frequencies when the when this is very small. It's not i gamma; it's i omega. Let me fix that. Yes, i omega. When the frequency is very small, then we have a real term. It behaves like the conductors that we've always talked about up to this point. But when the frequencies get higher and higher, this term begins to dominate and it becomes more and more imaginary um, at a high frequency. Example eight. Um, so let's calculate what happens when we subject, um, uh, let's say copper, uh, to a uh, high frequency. So copper has its uh, conductivity at low frequencies is about six times 10 to the seventh ohms per meter, no, uh, ohm meters, one ohm, one over ohm meters. Uh, its density is about nine times 10 to the third kilograms per meter cubed. And it has one free electron per atom. So our N, the number of atoms that we're talking about here is nine times 10 to the 28 per meter cubed. So, and so when we calculate our gamma for copper, we use this formula, NFQ squared divided by sigma at low frequencies, M, the mass of the electron, and plug that all in and we get four times 10 to the 13th hertz. Um, so that's in the infrared region, which implies that for frequencies lower than infrared, copper behaves like a very wonderful conductor. And something else happens at frequencies above infrared. 
So this isn't surprising. Copper doesn't um, look like silver. It doesn't behave quite as well as silver does in reflecting um, uh, visible frequencies back to us. Um, all right, uh, all of this. Uh, so when we're talking about high frequencies, let's write our kappa. So our kappa is going to be mu epsilon of the material, omega squared plus i sigma um, mu omega. That's when we, that's the wave equation, that's the kappa from the wave equation we got for uh, conductors. And um, one particular interesting case is what happens in um, plasmas when we have gases where basically our mu's and epsilons are equal to the, you know, mu is, is about equal to uh, mu naught and epsilon is about equal to epsilon naught. And so in this case, um, our equation for kappa squared becomes 1 over c squared times omega squared minus omega p squared, where p, omega p squared is the plasma frequency. Below this frequency, the, the plasma behaves like a conductor. Um, it reflects back the waves that you send up, so you send up at it. But beyond that, uh, when you go beyond that frequency, it behaves like a transparent, um, uh, like it, it allows the, the wave to go through it without much interaction. The interesting um, thing is if you calculate the velocity of waves at those high frequencies, you'll get this C times one minus uh, that squared to the um, negative one half. So C divided by that number. And there's a possibility the wave uh, could be traveling at faster than the speed of light, which uh, sounds like some kind of paradox or, or something like that is going on. But the end result is that the, the group speed does not go faster than the speed of light. And so if you were to put a wave into the plasma, it will not appear on the other side faster than the speed of light. The index of refraction, when we calculate that, n is equal to the square root of 1 minus our plasma frequency divided by the frequency you're driving in that squared. Okay. Um, so that's about all I have to say about that. The ionosphere. So those of you who do ham radio and are familiar with radio, so the Earth has this layer of atmosphere near the top. That, so here's the Earth. This is called the ionosphere. So named because when the sun is up, the the ultraviolet rays hit the ionosphere and cause it to turn into some sort of plasma. Um, so when, during the daytime, when, when you have that ionosphere being actively charged that way, it behaves like a, a conductor. It reflects back any uh, radio signals you send at it. But at nighttime, when the sun is gone, it behaves like a standard, it behaves like air. It doesn't reflect anything back. So depending on day or night, you know, it could go through. This is at night and during the daytime, it will be reflected back. Um, oh, actually what happens is the ionosphere moves up at nighttime because there's still ionizing radiation, just not from the sun. There's not much more to say on this. So this is, um, this is the curious effect that you get from, um, plugging the same equations into conductors and plasmas. And, and there's a lot more to be said in the book if you study it closely. Um, I really can't do it justice in this short video. So thank you for your time. Bye-bye.